The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everybody. Thank you, Gene, and welcome to another exciting adventure of As We See It. This is show number 38 being recorded on Sunday, April 15th, 2012, the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the RMS Titanic. If you missed it, go back to last week's show and listen to show number 37, entitled A Titanic Episode, and we pretty much spent the hour talking about it. So go back and listen to show number 37 if you have an interest in the Titanic. But today is the 100th anniversary officially. I'm Ed Jupin in Boston, Massachusetts. And joining us today, we have Fred Boaz in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. Holly Hurley is with us by phone today from St. Louis, Missouri. Larry Marks here in Boston and out in Los Angeles, California, Gene White. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, guys. So, what's new? What do we have going on here tonight? Well, I think the biggest news, right, is is on your end, actually, Ed. Are you guys getting ready for Big Boston tomorrow? It's a big heat wave tomorrow in Boston, and tomorrow is the Boston Marathon, the running of the Boston Marathon, which, luckily, we're not covering for BaseNet this year, so I'm not going to have to stand out there in the heat and the sun of... 85 degree plus weather. I mean, it's over 50 in Boston tomorrow. Yeah. Hey, it, it really, so you're saying it really helped you guys out that I moved to St. Louis. Now you don't have to go out there and watch me finish marathons. Ab- absolutely. So we're going to talk about it a little bit today, or right now, anyway. Then just to get the show started, Holly, as having run the marathon a couple of times, um, which what are your opinions or what's your vantage point on the marathon weather being 85 plus degrees how the how the heck do you run 26 miles in 85 degree weather well i gotta be honest with you ed i i have sort of conflicting feelings being from the piney woods of east texas where in the summer i used to start cross-country season at 105 degrees with 70 percent humidity my question is really what's the big deal but having run Boston when you've trained in a really nasty winter, I don't know if any of you guys remember, but or if you remember, Ed, but last winter in Boston was really gross. It was really nasty, lots of snow, lots of ice, really cold, and everybody had this terrible viral cold. I had it for six weeks while I was training and actually just ran through it, which is probably why I ended up having it for as long as I did. And then the marathon day, it was like 75. And I think the difficulty that Boston really has is if you're training in those hot, hot, hot days, you don't really have any problem with an 85-degree marathon. The the time that it really becomes an issue is when you've been training in, you know, 20 to 40-degree weather, and then all of a sudden the day of the marathon, it pops up to 75. Your body's not going to be ready for that. And so you're going to see some hydration issues. You're probably going to see a lot of... I don't really know any other way to say this, but probably a lot of throw-up, probably people being co- pulled off the course for dehydration. Uh, it's just, it's it's very common when the heat jumps like that to have some problems during the marathon. But I understand, actually, Larry, you're saying that people don't actually have to run it if, if they don't want to risk it. They can defer until next year's marathon. Wow. I mean, you know, it's so nice to have that flexibility because, you know, Boston's really hard to get into. I'm actually really surprised that they're allowing that. So, I mean, I would say my advice to anybody running the marathon is, you know, make sure you're hydrating. You know, I wouldn't try to make any PRs tomorrow if you've been training in the winter uh, because your your body's going to, your joints, your respiratory system are going to be going through some really interesting things. So, you know, take it easy, have a good have a good run, but make sure you're hydrating and make sure you're taking care of yourself out there. And, you know, for you guys, it'll be a nice, pleasant day for the college kids to come out and watch anyway. And the, apparently the um, organizing committee, whatever you call it, the racing association that puts this on, uh, to follow up on what Larry's saying, they've been reporting that they're going to literally like double the amount of Red Cross or EMS stations that are along the route. They're putting out like twice as many cases of water and all kinds of things. It looks like they're really taking this 85 to 90 degree weather seriously. That's why I guess I was, you know, where I'm 
looking at it a little differently than you, I guess I'm kind of buying into the whole theory of even the race committee where they seem to say that they think that it's potentially going to be a problem with 85, 90 degree weather for these runners. And then that's why, yes, they said that totally against what they've ever done, it might be other, other than this is, I think, the second time in history that they did a deferment thing like this. The first time was two years ago, which we did cover for BaseNet, when they had that big vol volcano or something went off, and a lot of the runners from somewhere in Europe or something couldn't get to the States because of the air travel was restricted because planes weren't flying because of the, volca the volcanic ash and everything in the air. That was the first time that they did a deferment, and then they say this is the second time that they're going to offer deferments to anybody that wants it. I remember that, actually. John and I ran that year, yep. and we were we were very, very glad. I know you guys covered it, and it was it was a lot of fun, actually. I think Larry had a big part in that, getting me help, getting me packed the night before. Yep, that was sure the part right. Yep, yep. And uh, and I I think I think that was even surprising to us. I mean, even in the face of world tragedies, I mean, obviously the BAA has been very very flexible with these things. But you know, I mean, it's it sort of depends what side of it you come from because you think about you know the Kenyans, for instance, who often win a lot of marathons around the world. I mean, they train in they the 85 for them will feel just like home. Oh, it's not going to bother them. Really, sure, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's really more just a problem for the racers who've been training in the cold weather. But I do think we've been a little bit lucky that we've had a well, not lucky because I have to say I ran a half marathon today and there were bugs all over the course. It was terrible. But we've been a little bit lucky to have a mild winter because at least, you know, these people aren't training in super cold temperatures, which will help them a little. But, I mean, as far as the – you were talking about the medical crews as well. As far as that's concerned, Boston's always right on top of it where that's concerned. I have to say – being in St. Louis, I mean, you know, obviously the Washington Medical Center here and uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital are one of the top in the country. But after living in Boston, I mean, nobody does medical like Boston. I have to say they are really, Massachusetts is really ahead of the curve, and Boston specifically really takes that seriously and has so many top-notch medical centers to pull from. I think maybe three of the top ten in the United States are on along the marathon path. And so I'm not at all surprised here that they're able to really provide the medical care these people need and I think that speaks volumes for the quality of the marathon. Very interesting. So that I guess in a nutshell is our 2012 marathon coverage for BaseNet. Uh, at least we got to talk about it thanks to that the, was easy, wasn't it? Thanks to the heat wave that's coming through. Sure and myself and the lobster don't have to stand out there at least in the 90 degree weather this year trying to cover it. Well, now you can do it as an option if you and, don't want to. And speaking of the lobster, why don't we uh, take it into lobster tales? Sounds good. Number one is in Samoa, it's against the law to forget your wife's birthday. Number two, in California, it is illegal to set a mousetrap without a hunting license. Number three, in Blythe, California, a person must own two cows before he can wear cowboy boots. Number four, in New York, the penalty for jumping off a building is death. And that one okay, I just, I just, I just got to say this right here, and you guys are going to be shocked here. Come out of my, my mouth, but damn liberals in, in California, you got to have a hunting license for a mousetrap. Come on. <laughs> I love that one. Well, sure, I can, I can gotta, see that. You've got to remember when these laws were written, though. I can see having a, a hunting license for mouth trap. What, what, if you just... what, raised, what raised by their mother, flower-toting hippie, put that rule on the book? <laughs> the re see, here's the reason why I think you need a hunting license. What if you just want to shoot the mouse between the eyes? As long as you've got a hunting license, it's legal. Well, right. then you don't need a trap, Larry. Uh, I think we need a hunting license for lobsters. <laughs> well, Could we declare it open season on lobster? Right. Never. <laughs> I'm sorry, Fred, you wanted to say something about jumping off a building. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time to jump off a building. <laughs> I like the one in Blythe, California. person must own two cows before you wear cowboy boots. I want to see the cops walking around enforcing that law. Yeah, as they're you know, walking they around in cowboy boots themselves. Well, you know, if they enforce that law, once again, where I grew up in East Texas, half of the people, then Texas would never even be known for wearing cowboy boots, because I have to tell you, most of the people down there who dress the part do not actually do the dirty work. Yeah, they're not cowboys. Not well, even a, a little. 
Well, it's like when people don't realize when you travel to places like California and Florida, the people with tans are tourists. Most of the people are working inside. Yeah, well, I mean, also, also, you think about the people. My my cousin does ride bulls, right? And he he rode bulls, amateur, but he got paid to do it for quite a long time. And a guy like that, yeah, he owns a few pairs of cowboy boots, and he uses them what you're supposed to use them for. When I rode horses, I had cowboy boots. But you think about the people who mostly wear them, and a lot of the guys I knew in high school who were quote-unquote cowboys, I mean, they, their family had no land. They lived in the tiny suburb and the tiny house in the town. And But they were cowboys. Kind of question, yeah, you kind of question that validity. You know? <laughs> You're like, I don't well, think had, you earned that hat, buddy. Come on, Holly. They had to tie their 10-speed up to the uh, hitching post. <laughs> <laughs> Well, having ridden a bike, I can say the firm sole on a cowboy boot would be useful, but the slippery bottom, mm-hmm. not so good. Now, what was it? what was the other one, Larry? What was number? Was it? Do we miss number two or number three? Miss number one. Oh, oh right. number! I thought number one was the mousetrap in California. It's against the law to forget your wife's birthday. You know what? That's sexist. That should go both ways. Because if if it went both ways, I would be in jail in Samoa because I constantly forget my husband's birthday. I'm the that's worst. Why, that's why you have a calendar in your phone to remind you. Is that filed under spousal abuse? Because you forgot your wife's birthday. It's, only if she only if she catches you after she after you forget it. It's spousal abuse on her part for hitting you over the head with the frying pan. That's true. <laughs> of course, you know another oh, thing. Yeah. If if you do forget your wife's birthday. You could end up wearing a birthday cake. I'd rather wear the birthday cake cake than the frying pan. Yeah, me too. True story. And speaking speaking of frying pans, that really does happen. I have had a frying pan thrown at me. The handle of the frying pan stuck into the sheetrock wall. Myself and my ex-wife just looked at each other and then started cracking up laughing. But it wasn't really so funny when I had that frying pan coming at me and then it ended up sticking in the wall. At least it's stuck into the wall and not into my head. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought, I thought, your, I thought your ex-wife a better shot than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your ex-wife had quite an arm. <laughs> hey, Fred, hey I'm, Fred, married to, I'm married to her sister. I was going to say, Fred knows all about this. He puts up with it every day. He's got her <laughs> sister. We should, we should get her down here working for the Cardinal. Yeah, really. Gene, don't go there. You know the same people we do. I know. (laughs) No comments, sir. (laughs) Is it safe to say this has gotten personal enough that maybe we should turn to Fred for some real news? (laughs) All right. Well, let's turn to some uh, some Fred news. Okay. Well, I got some some stuff. Everybody complains about paying their taxes. Well, today is not going to be tax day. Tomorrow is not going to be tax day. It's going to be Tuesday. Because as we all know, that April 15th is a Sunday this year. We don't pay taxes on Sundays. God knows why. And tomorrow is Emancipation Day in Washington with the local holiday, so they extend it one more day. But tax day was not always on April 15th. It was at the end of March at one time. They actually chose March 1st as tax day. They speculated it was because they, when March 1st fell exact one year after the 16th Amendment was, pe- was enacted. They moved it out to the 15th of April. Primarily so the government can get more money out of you. We passed the 16th Amendment with July 2nd, 1909, which means we weren't even paying income tax for a little bit over 100 years. So there's a little bit of little known facts for you from us. Anyway, getting into the news, Charles Manson was denied parole again, which is a big surprise to nobody. Probably for the last time because his next parole hearing won't be for 12 or 15 years or something. And then at that point, he'll be in his <laughs> early 90s. He'll be 92. Yeah, my, my- my favorite part of the story, though, Fred, is that he said to his parole board, and he bragged to a prison psychologist, I am a very dangerous man. Duh. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean <laughs> like, funny how point, stupid that... is our court system? How stupid is our court system that Charles Manson has to verbally tell someone he's a dangerous man? Well, you have to understand, Charles Manson also knows if he gets out of prison, he's a dead man. He understands this. He, he did say to them, I'm special. I'm not like the average inmate. Uh, I have ve- I have spent my my life in prison. I have put five people in the grave. I'm a very dangerous man. He know he uh, knows he's saying this because Charles Manson. If you listen to him, though, he's not stupid. He may be insane. He may be crazy, but he's not stupid. And he knows that he scares people. He knows that if he goes in front of the parole board and says stuff like this, they're not going to let him out. Which is what he wants, because he knows on the outside he's going to get. He's going to get. get, He he won't last five minutes on the outside. There are people who want to kill him. Now the problem is there are still people out there to support this whack job. And well, at this point, at this point, it's seventy-seven years old. 
what purpose would it serve anyway? Let him stay where he's at because he's already oh, yeah. he's already seventy seven. Whether whether he lives another year or another thirty one years, for all intents and purposes, an old man already now anyway. So just oh, yeah. let him let him stay to that lifestyle that he's now accustomed because he's been there for so long. Makes no sense I'm to really release him at this point. Mean, I, I'm really curious, and I know you guys are very young men and probably don't remember this, but possibly remember it more acutely than I would. But I grew up hearing about Helter Skelter. We grew up seeing movies or seeing the musical Assassins, you know, which basically is almost farcical in comparison. And I, I would wonder, I would wonder what you guys feel like having this brought up every few years. I mean, do you remember the original incident? Do you remember the prison time? Uh, you know, do you, do you remember when this happened, especially Eugene, now that you're in L.A.? Well, it goes a little further than that. I was in the La Bianca house in the Los Feliz oh, section of California. No. And yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. now this was in the early 80s, so it was only 15 years, what, 15 years or something after the murders. Um, yeah. Very, very, very weird to be in that house. So, they, yeah. They also, they had to change the physical street number street on number, the house. Street number, yep. Because people, now it's no longer, of course, owned by Tate or LaBianca, but... People it wasn't when I was in it either. Using that no. address, trying to find out, taking pictures, taking souvenirs. <laughs> so that changes the, but that's uh, that's so out. ridiculous, though. I mean, yes, that's that's absolutely true. You're one thousand percent right. But it's so ridiculous. Like, let's just say, and I'm not going to give out numbers. Say you have one house that's a hundred. Then say the La Bianca house was one hundred four, and then the next house was one hundred eight. Well, they renumbered it to where it's you still have house one hundred. Then the La Bianca house, which was 104, it's now 213, and then you go to 108. Duh. Well, we don't <laughs> how, know how stupid is that? Done it now, but yeah. So, well, that's, that's right. how it was when I was there, because uh, oh, they, they had changed it when I was there. And the number is totally out of sequence to every other house on the street. So, that's ridiculous also. Yeah, well, I mean, but it's not that drastically bigger, is it? What, the house? Oh, the, num the number? The number? Yeah. yeah, it was ridiculous. It's not like they went from 100 to 104 and then changed 104 to, say, 107 or something, and then you have the next house is 108. Uh, yeah, it was a drastic number change. Wow. Now, uh, he's, uh, Fred's absolutely right. Now, in the ensuing past 30 years, they may have renumbered it again to have it make a little more sense. Maybe the 104 is now 104 and a half or something. But or they, at, may have numbered the, they may have numbered the entire renumbered the entire, renumbered the entire street. Five, right. You know? Exactly. Probably, but at the time, yeah. it, it was well, ridiculous. So yeah, that's my time. Were, that's my time. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, that's my tie into it. You were is, talking about that, that, that people came and took pieces and that he has all these fans. And, you know, that correlates. And, and what really frightens me is some of the infractions that he's caused since he's been there had been obtaining illegal cell phones. And, I mean, this guy basically brainwashed hundreds of people. I mean, I will say three specific. I mean, you can mm -hmm. talk about the men's and women. But then you want to you want to talk about all these people who still sort of worship him and think he's amazing. And the fact that he has access to cell phones, I mean, that, that freaks me out. But what really freaks me out is I could not see any prison guard. I mean, as you, as you said, you know, Ed, he's not stupid. He's a smart guy, or maybe it was Fred that said that. He's not stupid. He's a smart guy, even if he's crazy. And, you know, he's finding ways to communicate with people on the outside. I mean, that sort of makes me think of that movie Copycat. It makes me feel like he could still get done all kinds of evil outside of prison. He's doing, in, I mean, obviously he's doing evil inside of prison, but if you're Charles Manson, you have to because you're constantly in danger. But, but outside of prison as well, that, that frightens me. Well, you know, you know what scares me more is I, I look at somebody like Manson as a little fish in the big sea at this point, at this stage Very in good. his life, or maybe even when these all of these murders took place. Primarily a nobody. I've never looked, other than as a serial killer, I've never looked at him as being anybody to lose sleep over. But along the lines of what you're talking about, cell phones and how people still run their organizations from within the four walls of prison, look at somebody like the John Gotti's, who of course is no longer with us. You lock somebody like John Gotti up, 
he still ran his or and it's no secret he ran his organization from within the four walls of prison so now there's somebody that's a lot scarier somebody like that that's really scary how that they're capable of still running their organization from behind the four walls see part of the problem is that the press can't leave it alone the best thing they can the best thing they do actually the most amount of harm they can do to charles manson is don't go there and interview him put him in solitary lock him up Throw away the keys, keep the cameras out. He has no audience at that point. I mean, I've seen four and five and six different interviews over the last 30 years that he gets there and he gets to play a big audience, gets to play the big scary guy. Yeah, and they keep keep releasing new pictures of him too. They keep saying every, every year, for instance, you know, you see a new picture of him. Here's what Manson looks like now. We don't need to see a new picture of him every year. He's in jail. Key, lock him away, throw away the key, and stop interviewing him. I mean, he, my, we were watching an interview with him about two weeks ago, and it's the same one that they talk about in the article. I'm, I'm watching one right now on, on the computer where they're interviewing Charles Manson about five, about five or ten years ago. And as long as you keep interviewing him, and I understand the par- that the families want closure. They're interviewing right now the sister of Sharon Tate. But what happens is the more exposure you give him, the more he's getting his 15 minutes of fame, as they call it. You're keeping him in the spotlight. People don't forget. I don't want people to forget what he did, but don't give him that spotlight where he can come out with the crazy boogeyman. If he's locked up in solitary and the press can't interview him, basically, he goes away, he dies, it's over. I think we should send Gene up to there to interview interview him. Sure. Be a good idea. This guy's interesting anyway, I'll tell you. (laughs) Well, see, that's the problem. It's like, you know, as you guys are talking, first I was thinking, don't call Charles, Charles Manson not dangerous. He'll make a phone call on you. Uh, God willing. I mean, dangerous. not God willing, but, you know, yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Ed, Ed said that. It wasn't you. I, I, there was a lot going on. And then, uh, and then you, I don't think you he said is. Fred. Well, and then you said, Fred, that I mean, the, photos, the last photos were released like three years ago, and that's almost worse because it's like they wait a little while and then they release enough. It's like they're doing his PR for him. They're mm-hmm. they're building momentum on this suspense of what's he doing, what does he look like now. Well, that's this Fred's point. Crazy. You know, why why so do they keep you doing this PR for him? Just lock him away, throw away the key. Why are they doing this public relations uh, bit on him? And part of the problem, and, I, and I'm not trying to talk about any kind of... A political statement, but remember the man was sentenced to death. And because of California repealing the death penalty laws being unconstitutional, he is now on, uh, on a life sentence, which means he's costing us a fortune and we're getting all this stuff out of it. If they'd put him to death like they, w- like they were supposed to, the story would have been be, over 40 years ago. The story would go this far and it'd be done over with, and there would be no Charles Manson to haunt people in their sleep. And you know what, Fred? I have to agree with you on that front. That's I, I do feel it respects the decision of the court, and I, I do feel like, especially in cases like this one, sometimes maybe it is just better to let him die. Let it die with him. Sister Sharon Tate was at the hearing, like, hasn't she lived through this long enough? I, I don't think she should have to live through this over and over well, and over it's again. Also, every it's, time also, for it's also bringing fame and more notoriety to the family. It brings them back into the spotlight, brings them back into people people telling them how sorry they are. It, it, it reassures the family, and that's all fine. But people have to remember that, you know, Sharon Tate was married to Roman Polanski at the time. Sharon Tate was pregnant. Members of his team family, club, whatever you want to call them, killed her and her unborn child. Among, then they went over and killed the, killed the LaBiancas. It wasn't just Sharon Tate. It wasn't just them. They killed two sets of people on his orders. A couple miles apart. A couple miles yeah. apart. And what does he get for it? A life sentence? No, no. He should have been just taken out and executed right there. And he would done. And that's justice for the family. Because now, even though they're getting their, they get their little time talking to the press, these people still don't have the closure. This man's still alive. He's getting three hots in a cot from the state at the state at state expense. And the guy's scaring the bejesus out of people. Here we are. We're all watching it, including me. That's a good point. I gotta say, Fred makes a good point. I'm, I'm with I'm with you on that, Fred. I just I don't see any reason. 
it, it's so sad because you know we're we're covering this. I'm interested in it. I'm a part of the problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Good point. And that that's that's what gets me is like with situations like this and the whole thing about serial killers. You know, my husband loves to read books about serial killers. I love to watch Silence of the Lambs. All we're doing is perpetuating the problem because these are people who are narcissistic who get off on doing something they can get away with, and we're basically saying like, "Ooh, that's interesting to me. Give me more of that." sort of sick and demented that, you know, if we didn't care, they wouldn't exist. But if we didn't care, then who would be saying, put him away, keep him away? So it's like this, this self-perpetuating problem. It's really, it's really kind of sick and twisted. But, All yeah, right. So, of, yeah, I was going to say, so I guess. wants we... to be this guy's son, right? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, okay, Fred, I want, I want to hear you no. talk about this. No, come on. No, I don't want to know. There's a, a guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, what, no, what, what did I just sleep through? Fred is Charles Manson's son? No, the, uh, the, the, <laughs> there's a guy, there's a guy claiming to be, uh, who wants a DNA test done because he thinks that he might be Charles Manson's illegitimate son. Well, you know, like he's going to have a legitimate son, but illegitimate son from a sex orgy that he had 33 or 44 years ago. The kid's name is Matthew Roberts. So well, that's certainly possible. He's not a kid. He's 44. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and that's certainly possible that it could have happened. But they said well, Yeah, here's the worst part. His mom says it's definitely possible. His mom says, yeah, I was in an orgy with Charles Manson. It's okay. possible. Why would yeah. be your dad? Why would Charles Manson's son? Well, the worst part is, is that the guy is basically crying for help, telling the press that he wakes up covered in spiders and has nightmares, and, and it's a little bit crazy and knows what goes on in his own head, which, you know, for those of you... So he can are, blame, uh, he can blame it on Charles Manson now rather than blaming it on whatever else it is. He goes, Charles Manson's son, so it's okay. Yeah, but here's the sick part. People keep interviewing him. He is free and walking the streets, and he's basically crying for help, saying, hey, I'm a psychopath. Somebody treat me. I also might be Charles Manson's son, which means I may be a psychopath genetically, not just by chance. Like, I'm so now we're, blaming on, we're, not, we're, so we're going to blame it on Gene's now, so it's not his fault. Don't blame it on Gene. Don't, don't blame yeah, it don't on Gene. Gene, they're blaming it on you, Gene. It's not my <laughs> fault. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm talking something else completely. But no, it's who run the DNA test on right him. over their heads, Jim. I know. Well, who cares about the DNA test? Put this guy in the mental hospital or give him some help. Give him a psychiatrist. Why are we letting this guy run around and talk to the press and nobody's stepping up and saying, hey, maybe he needs to be treated for something? That's true, too. And they should be treating him anyway. But he's saying, I may be Charles Manson's son. Okay, maybe you are, maybe you're not. If he's not, he still needs to be treated. But let's find out if he is. I mean, the kid's trouble. He's admitting that on his own. Maybe there's a reason, maybe there's not. Maybe there's a connection, maybe there's not. If he needs to be treated, let's get him treated. But what annoys me is when, is when they well, start... Well, does it look like he's reaching out for help? Or is he, he is. just making a statement saying that I'm not that familiar with the in-depth details of the storyline, so that's why I'm asking. Is he reaching out for help literally, or is he just trying to make his point known that he thinks that he may be Charles Manson's son? Well, I mean, I do think he's saying that he may be Charles Manson's son, but when a guy makes a public statement to a reporter that he that he wakes up covered in spiders and he knows what goes on in his own head and that sometimes oh, yeah, he sees things that aren't there, that's a, public, that's a public cry for help. You know, it's interesting. I'm looking at the picture right now. They've got Charles Manson and this guy side by side, <laughs> and the guy does have Charles Manson's eyes. Mm-hmm. So he could very well be um, related to uh, Charles Manson. Uh, yeah, I, I see no reason. Eyes. I see no reason to doubt that he very well could be his son. Yeah. But but why in the hell actually. would anybody want to admit? Why would that? you want to admit it anyway? Absolutely. I mean, that, yeah. that's my whole thing, and I, and I understand where he's going, but that's not something that you. That I want people to know about. I mean, here now. I mean, and, and if it turns out he's not. People are going to say, well, you just need 15 minutes of fame. Let's get the kid treated, find out if there is something wrong with him. If there is, get it treated, whether he's Charles Manson's kid or not. If he's Charles Manson's son, let's lock him up with his father so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Who's to say he's got the uh, tendencies that Charles Manson has, too? 
Well, people I mean, you're say already he, condemning the kid before you, or the guy before you even have a chance to know him. People are using that same excuse for alcoholism and drug and drug addiction, saying, "Well, it's genetic. I got it if my parents were alcoholic, so pay me uh, six hundred eighty-three dollars a month, social security disability, let me live off the state." And yet, it doesn't work because the entire family doesn't get that. It is what it is. But if this kid, well, got my the- my issue with that though, Fred, is too, and I know this is a verging into an area that we're not actually talking about, but don't give him money. Give him treatment. Give him the treatment. Absolutely. Get him treated. Yeah. No matter what the situation is. That. He's crying for help. Get him treatment. Absolutely. Get him the treatment. Get it to him now because we don't want to sit there and have these people and go, well, guess what? I told you three months ago that, that this was happening. Yep. I agree. 100%. I guess we'll I guess we'll update this when this guy actually uh, bravely goes and gets his DNA test to find out the truth. Although I don't know if the prison if the prison's going to allow that. I don't know what they I don't know what they're going to do. I still want to know the, why why would I would think you ha- I would think you have to. Don't if if you don't know for sure who a parent is and you have reason to believe in a case like that and you want to do DNA testing. I almost think that they have to allow that. Well, you have to get permission from both sides. Oh yeah, right. But I'm saying, yeah. but if but if Manson agrees to DNA tests and this guy not requesting it, I don't think the state could say no. We're not going to allow it. Well, they, they have to. Who, they, who's going to go in and get that sample? They can. They can. Look, they can see. <laughs> no, just, it's just a hair or anything. No, they've got. I'm sure they've got DNA from Charles Manson. They yeah, and, and you get it off of a hair. Piece okay. of, you know, so they, they piece get from the mother, they can run the test, they get it from the kid. They're a private, I mean, you, you watch the Maury show. They're using private companies without court orders to run DNA tests because everybody agrees. Okay, do the same thing, get the same company, find out if, yes, Charles, you are the father. Find out what goes on, and if this kid is his father, find just find out. But what happens is that those tests are also very expensive. They run about four to five thousand. Yeah, so it's like who's going to pay for it? And yeah, you know, so what happens? Well, this that, guy. Yeah, well, if well, he, if he wants, he wants if he wants a test and he wants to pay for it, fine. I have no problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, I have a problem. What I'm I have to pay for it. Right. Yes, that's my problem too. I and won't pay to find out if this guy is Charles Manson. Somebody, if he wants to, he can do and, that. The problem is he's that's where he's heading. He wants the state to pay for it. No. Can't see the state paying for something like that. Because if you if you're right, that's a little different. But what if you're wrong? You find not your son. Well, sorry guys, we just blew eight thousand mm-hmm. dollars of the state's money, but that's okay. Get the kid treated. If he's willing to pay for it, and if Manson and the mother and the mother's saying obviously, well it could have happened. Okay. No problem. She's obviously in agreement to it. If Manson's in agreement, he's such a nutball, he'd probably be in agreement to it. If we have a match, okay, fine. But still get the kid treated. The main thing is getting this kid treated and finding out what, if anything, is wrong with him. Yeah, that sounds like a good start. Obviously, he's he's crying for help. That's that's my point. Like, you know, coming out in public and saying that you're experiencing the, the symptoms of psychosis is saying, hey, somebody help me out. But then if, if as a part of that, if he, if he wants to get the DNA testing done, that's fine. But if he thinks he's, you know, going to be a problem for the rest of the world, if he's got a problem with psychosis, I, I want him treated. We want him diagnosed is what we want. We, we don't know what the treatment can or cannot be. We're not medical. But I want him at least do we know diagnosed. who the, uh, the mother is? Yes, they do. Well, they know who the mother is. We, I mean, I have we no don't, idea. Who she, don't I don't know. think they mentioned her name in the thing, but apparently she was asking, at yeah. an orgy with Charles Manson and suspects she might have had sex with him as one of her partners at said orgy. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, there, the 70s. Some, I wasn't some, alive back then. How is that for you guys? something you want to admit when you're in your 70s or somebody. Yeah, sure, I had sex with Charles Manson. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, the worst, the worst part of that story is, okay, you find, he was adopted, right? So he goes out, he finds his, he finds his biological mother and the question he has for her is not wow mom why'd you give me up what happened after all these years hey were you at an orgy with charles manson in the 70s as a matter of fact i was that's a good point son i was at an orgy in the 70s with charles manson it's a possibility i think i'd rather find out that darth vader was my father touche luke i am your father i'm your father Hey, Gene, Ooh, you remember, Gene, you remember that expression, if you can remember the 60s, you didn't live the 60s? Yeah, really. <laughs> and I don't remember much Oh, about God. The 60s. Oh, Fred, please take us out of here. I don't want to know what you guys were doing in the 60s. Well, okay, well, going from the sublime <laughs> to the ridiculous, how about this one? A 35-year-old man accidentally pays for pizza with crystal meth. 
<laughs> How stupid do you got? The guy was staying at a hotel in uh, at the Sunset Hotel in Wichita, Kansas. Hands a girl a wad of money for to pay for pizza she delivers. She notices a bag of crystal meth, calls the cops, and the guy gets busted. That has got to be from. That's something that should be on on America's dumbest criminals because that guy is just a they're just stupid. That is just, how do you pay somebody and not know there's a bag of crack in there? Okay, I have a story for this, Fred, and then and it will answer your question. Just bear with me. My I have a friend who worked at a who worked at a lumber mill, and he had a three year old son. And this was back in the days when that Shaggy song was really cool. I I caught I caught she caught me red handed banging on the bathroom floor, and his three year old son said, "Daddy." Why were they banging on the bathroom floor? And the father, without missing a beat, looked at his son and said, Son, that's what drugs will do to you. That's beautiful. So yeah. you know what? Don't just that's don't perfect. do crystal meth because it'll ruin your life. Don't do crystal meth because you might end up paying for pizza with it and getting arrested. <laughs> well, the funny part is that uh, a Lieutenant Doug Nolte of the Wichita Police Department says, We believe he did not realize he had, in fact, given her some drugs. Well, Lieutenant... As they say in the vernacular, no shit. I don't think he was intending to pay her for drugs with uh, for pizza with drugs. They went to the apparently police went to the man's hotel room where they found cocaine and more meth. Well, that's an obvious one too, but it's just funny. And not the suspect's not been identified. Was arrested, booked to uh, booked to jail. This comes out a uh, through the Pocono record. You can read more at uh, Kansas at www.kansas.com, and I'm sure it'll have a lot of stuff for you. But I just think I thought that was a great story. Obviously, this guy was strung out or something, because if he was in his right mind, he wouldn't have accidentally did anything like that. If he was in his right mind, he wouldn't be having drugs in the first place. Exactly. Coming out from North Carolina, the North Carolina town. They, they want they want to stop people from using cell phones at all. Pennsylvania, we have a texting law, which has gained uh, several tickets. We'll talk about that one later. But here, North Carolina town, if you're driving in Chapel Hill and you're talking on your cell phone, they're gonna ha they're gonna tag you. And I, you know, and I read this article. I think it's a great idea. I mean, they make Bluetooth. You can buy Bluetooth ear devices for twenty bucks. You got the ones that attach with the cord or the the wire to your phone. There's no reason for people to be driving with one hand on their phone, one hand on the steering wheel, one hand on the radio. You know, I mean, even in this day and age, with 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 hands-free devices, no reason for people not to have some kind of Bluetooth. And I'm behind Chapel Hill on this one, 100 percent. I am, too. Well, I, I understand, Fred, that in your state, they've actually caught about six people per week since the ban went up, right? About 31 since it started five weeks ago? Yeah, and what they're doing in Pennsylvania is a little bit different. They are telling you, if you're t they were having a problem with trying to recognize whether somebody, because you're allowed to look up a number. You're allowed to hit send for a phone call. The state police aren't making that the distinction. If you're tech, if you, if you're using the phone, you're using the key, you're texting, and they're getting tickets out of it. And the magistrates are making it stick because they're saying you're still. Either way, the intent of the law is no is, is not to have your hand to hand playing with the phone. They're making it stick, and they you know, and 31 tickets in five weeks, and they're, they're 50 dollars a pop. That's 1,500 dollars the Commonwealth made. I don't know what Chapel Hill, North Carolina, is going to do. Or what they're finding is, but I like the idea is because I still see people today driving down the road. They're all over the road with their phone, you know, talking on their phones, and it, 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 they're causing accidents, and it's unsafe. And I hope they start tagging people for more than fifty bucks. Hey, Gene, what's up? What, what's the laws out in California? They still are they allowing it or what? No, they're cracking down pretty good out here as well. And I think first offense is something like one hundred and twenty-nine dollars, and it goes up from there. In the article about North Carolina, it says if they stop you for something else and you're talking on the phone, you get ticketed for that. Is that what they do in California? Yeah, pretty much there, Larry. Because, because that, that's the best way to catch someone. Well, the thing is, in Pennsylvania and in a lot of states now, they're making the t cell phone and texting the primary crime rather than the secondary crime. In a lot of states, you can't pull somebody over for simply talking on a cell phone, and you should be able to. But wow. that should be the crime in itself, because you have to without wait till the guy does something else, which he will do. We understand that. But you get him for the cell phone, get him for the texting, do it on its own, and get people to stop. Because they're great commercials they're showing. Stop texting. How long it takes to 
people are getting killed out there because people, kids are texting, people are texting, people are talking on the phone. Let's get it stopped. Again, Bluetooth, $20. You can buy a cheap Bluetooth for your phone. It'll work. It'll get things done. And you know something? You got to make a phone call that bad. Pull the hell over. Do you think it's okay to do it if you have, like, a Bluetooth or a hands-free device? Absolutely, it's because cool. it's it's completely voice-activated. Voice you, you could use something like Vlingo that we've plugged before here. And Vlingo allows you to do everything by verbal commands. You could dictate a text message, an email, make phone calls, do anything just verbally. You never have to physically touch the phone itself. And what, what's nice about Vlingo, they have a, you said Ed, that you have a guy who does all his stuff in, the, uh, in, in an office mode. I can take it in my car, push a steering wheel key, uh, key and it shows in a car where I just push a button and it just says, what do you want to do? I want to call this, I want to call, it's specially made for the car. You don't have to touch anything. All you do is tap the side of your, tap the button on your uh, Bluetooth and yep. ask you what do you want to do. Well, I'll, I'll go you one better on that, Fred. My husband installed my Bluetooth connects to my radio system in my phone, so I can voice activate my phone, call people through the stereo in my car. It has a little microphone right. up there. Yep. Well, I don't yeah, have to where, take my hands off get, the wheel at all. Get that. I'm looking for one of those. Oh, they've, they've, uh, they've had that for a number of years. Usually, yeah, we got it done over, actually, well, Ed will know. We got it done on Commonwealth Avenue, and we really like the guys. I'd be happy to recommend them to you, but we have, like, an Alpine system, and it connects through my stereo. Yeah, any, anybody, that does, anybody that does car audio and everything could install that. I got yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it's yeah, I, like, I, can, I can plug my phone in and just talk to the car, basically, and the car will, and, and, and the car will call for you. Yeah, I, I mean, can... I don't even have to plug my phone in. It's Bluetooth. So when I throw my bag in the back seat, it's automatically connected. So, like, if I need to get an important phone call and I'm also having to drive somewhere, I mean, I don't take my hands off the wheel at all, not even for uh, a second. First of all, that should, be, that should be standard equipment in every car. Second of all, if you, you know, and that's why I'm saying you get the Bluetooth, get all, and that doesn't cost that much to get this kind of stuff for your car. It should be, and if it's not, you know something, shame on the manufacturer, shame on us for not getting it, but shame on the police and shame on the states for not giving these people severe fines and tickets. No, I mean, I, I think that's fair, although I have to say mine was pretty expensive, but my car was inexpensive, you know what I mean? So I feel like if you buy a car new, new car, and a lot of the new cars come with it. A lot of the new cars come with OnStar or a similar program, or well, they I, automatically connect, or you can plug your phone in. On, OnStar is only available new through uh, General Motors, but no, you but can buy, but you Ford's, can buy it. Fords come with it now. Yeah, so. but you can, yeah, you can yeah. buy it. You can buy something called uh, FMC, which is which will allow you to put it in your car. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I mean, Ford I has uh, Ford devices called the Sync. Ford Sync. Yeah, and I mean, I have a Subaru, so we put it in. But my car was used. It's from 2006 when the technology would have been only on Star. But now, I mean, it directly works with my cell phone. I think it's great. But it was it was expensive. But like I said, my car was inexpensive, so it balances out. And what's yeah, but the set the cost savings phenomenal. I I got to look into that. In defense of the manufacturers, with every phone that you buy new, anyway, obviously, if you buy one used, it might no longer be there because the person will keep it. But any new phone that you buy, and this has been the case for at least 10 years now, you get a free earbud microphone thing that's hardwired in. So worst case scenario, if you don't have the 20 bucks to even buy the lowest end Bluetooth, every phone manufacturer gives you a hardwired hands-free device. So there's there's no excuses. So I'm, I'm in 100% agreement with everybody in this conversation. This may be unprecedented for us, for all of us, to be on the exact same page. It's not so much that. They're, they're, they're just things that make sense. They're, 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 state, they're simple safety issues out there. We're talking families. We're talking, I mean, I have a 19-year-old here. He doesn't, he's really reluctant to learn how to drive because the people out there are just whack jobs. I mean, he sees what's going on around him. He says, I don't want to deal with these people. I mean, my wife didn't learn to drive until she was 25. I couldn't wait to learn to drive until I was 17. You know, something I wish I didn't know how. But it's just, you know, it's, I've been driving more than half my life. So is Ed. And, you know, we grew up in an area where, you know, where you, where if you, if you didn't respect the traffic laws, the cops, t the cops took you home and, and told your parents it was gone. And your father took your keys away from you. At least my parents did anyway. Now, you know, you got kids out there. I mean, I was coming up to a street where I had the right of way. The kid comes out. Blows the stop sign, goes by me and flips me to one finger salute. And I have no idea why, but laughing the whole time, 
I mean, yeah, you you're know, the it, bad guy. It's crazy. Yeah. The idea that I understand, I mean, I've had people try to force me off the road on a three lane highway. I mean, come on, you can't, if you're in that much of a hurry, leave five or ten minutes earlier. If you can't leave five or ten minutes earlier, well, don't make appointments that aren't that tight behind you. Ed will tell you, I come places early, so does he. We get there early for a reason. Get there early, I don't want to be rushed going someplace. I don't want to be feeling like I have to be somewhere. If I got to be in New York at 10 o'clock, I take the bus to arrive at 930. That gives me a half hour in case there's traffic problems. I see that constantly. I use the train system all the time in the Boston area and never fails. We could go to the local train stop right now, and I guarantee you that you'll see it with at least one person. You'll hear the announcement that the, the next train is approaching the station, and you see people running from the parking lot or whatnot to go into the station and up to the tracks. That's your point, Fred. You know, you leave five minutes earlier. Unless there's that rare occasion where I was legitimately running late and I didn't want to then wait 10 or 15 minutes for the next train to come through. Uh, so there's only been that rare instance where I've run. But from what I see with a lot of these people, this is just an everyday occurrence. They run that tight of a schedule, and they're running for their train. Well, leave five well, minutes earlier, and you won't have to New run York, for your train. What I remember from living in New York is I remember just thinking, this, I remember being in such a hurry all the time. And then one day it occurred to me, you know, if I just plan to get there 30 minutes early, whatever happens, happens. You can't control the subway. You just go and you do the best you can. And it just really made me relax. And I stopped pushing people and I stopped yelling at people for no reason. And you just begin to realize, like, wherever you have to be, because when you drive like that, when you drive crazy or when you run crazy, you know, there's always a possibility of hurting someone else physically, literally, especially when you're driving, 100% when you're driving. Part of the problem is that people say, it takes me 10 minutes to get to work, Okay. And say, so what time do you leave work? If I have to work at 8 o'clock, it takes me 10 minutes to leave at 20 minutes to 8. That gives me 10 extra minutes. Oh, why would you leave so early? What do you mean, why would I leave so early? Why leave 10 of? And then if there's a problem, you can't make up the time. I'll get there early. I'm relaxed. I don't have to worry about anything. People laugh. I've gone, when I've taken airline flights, I haven't done that in a long time, but when I've taken airline, I get to the airport three hours early. I get there, I'm there, I'm checked in, I'm not going to be flying standby, I got my seat, I sit back, relax, have a soda, I play spy at the airport, but that's okay, but the idea is that, you know, I make sure that I'm there on time, I know that I got a seat, watch these people, and they tell you this, be there an hour ahead of time, well, I'm there two hours ahead of time. When we went to New York, I got to, we had a specific time to meet, we were all there early, I think I was running a little late because my bus was running late, but... What happened is that we get to a certain time, we knew we had to do, we were relaxed, we were able to walk, do what we had to do, we, were, we weren't rushed. We said, no, oh, did we walk? Rushed. Yeah, well. <laughs> I walk, I, I'm sorry, I walk. I'm not taking subways if I can avoid it. I'm taxes are too damn expensive, and yep. you know, it, it's good to walk. The idea is that pe this is part of society we have now. I mean, that is that phone call that people are taking on, uh, in their car so important, and most of it's not. But you were left work, and now you're talking for a half hour on your way home from work. You're on the phone. I know people that are on. Every time I see these people, they're on the mm -hmm. phone. I got 700 minutes being shared between three people on a family plan. I don't even come close to that. It, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's so important that these people live on the phone. Exactly. <laughs> they do. You know, you're talking about getting, getting to work early. I mean, I see it every day. You know, you can tell the difference between a guest and an employee at uh, where I work. They're going up the hill, and they're, I mean, the speed limit's like 25 miles an hour, and they're doing like 50 to get up the hill to get into the parking lot uh -huh. to uh, get up to wardrobe and change. And you can always tell the employees from the guests. Like I said, you know, they're yep. up there, and the guests are going slow because they don't know where they're going and stuff like that. And they're zooming in and out of these guest uh, cars. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> You don't know why they don't have more accidents on the hill yeah. over it. Uh, yeah, but you know, the thing is this, though. If they taught these people to get there 15 minutes earlier, if you have to start your shift at 9 o'clock, get there at quarter to 9. Now you have 15 minutes not to speed in, to walk to where you have to go, to make your wardrobe change. I understand exactly what you're talking about. There's no excuse for those employees. Because I'll tell you something. If I was the head of security where you work, those people would lose their privilege driving the cars on the property. They'd be parking them off the property somewhere. And then you're going to be really late because you got to walk 20 minutes to get in. I train people at Universal, new people coming in. 
And that's one of the things I tell them. I tell them, give yourself at least an hour to get into work, get, get your uh, uniform, get changed, and get over to your attraction. So this way you're ready to work. And uh, I kind of uh, instill that into them. But there's still those guys that just don't get it. And no, the, the people that live closer are the ones that have problem getting to work on time than the ones that live far away. Yeah. They live mm-hmm. far away, get to the work early. The ones yeah. that are close, oh, I, I got plenty of time. You know, like we were saying before, Fred, and the, <laughs> it happens every time. And the guy lives close. He's dressed like a chipmunk running through the park. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I used to have that when I when another job I worked out with a guy who lived in town couldn't make it in on a snow day, but I could make it in Pennsylvania. All the people living out of town could make it, and the guy who lived in town couldn't. Right. There you, you go. Know, it, the idea that all this comes from, from the type of society where everybody wants they, 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 only 24 hours a day. We want to 27 hour day lives. Relax. I mean, I see it on the weekends. I got to go here. I go, no, you don't got to go here. You don't got to go here. You know, I remember a line from the uh, movie Lean on Me with Morgan Freeman where he says, I don't have to do nothing but stay black and die. That's the only thing you have to do in life. Everything else is an option. You have an option of getting up 15 minutes earlier. Get up 15 minutes earlier. Get dressed. That leaves now when you leave the house 15 minutes or you have 15 minutes more to go walk, go, go, go stop in Dunkin' Donuts or wherever you get your coffee, get your coffee, drive in, you park your car, you have 10 minutes, you can get, and you're not stressed out. It's exactly beautiful- right. Yes. And I say we invoke our option of moving on to the next topic. Yes, we do. <laughs> I love it. Well, the, I, I think this is interesting because you were saying you don't have to do anything and you always have a choice. And the farmers right now are actually uh, interested in the choice, and this may affect the rest of us. Alfalfa farmers, I mean, you know, we're all kind of concerned about the weather. We talked about Boston earlier and how it's gotten warm earlier and it may get cold again. And so now farmers are fixed with the dilemma, and probably not just alfalfa farmers, but it applies to humans that the alfalfa farmers, which is what we feed cows, which is, of course, where we get beef, are trying to debate on, you know, the alfalfa has been growing really fast, and if another cold snap happens, it's all going to die. And so they're sort of in a mix of do we pull it now, do we go ahead and, and harvest it even though it's a little early, or oh, wow. all over the country this is something that, I mean, because the, the weather has been strange. They actually call it weird on American public radio, if you would believe it or not, American public media. But, you know, they call it weird, but, I mean, the weather across the country has just been weird. I can't think of a better way to say it. And it's basically causing the problem that all over the country right now, especially in Wisconsin, which is where a lot of the alfalfa has grown, people are debating on, you know, what do we do to feed the cows? Do we harvest it early and maybe they don't get as well fed? Or do we wait a little longer to the prime height and risk losing all of it to the frost? We do what they do in areas that don't grow alfalfa. We feed them grass. We feed them hay. That's what you're going to do. Uh, you don't want your dairy cows eating hay if they're supposed to eat alfalfa. They, they or hay, corn, all have the, the dairy, cows, frankly, dairy cows in New Jersey are fed on hay. They're fed on grasses and hay. They're, they do it all the well, time. You do, you do realize that hay is made out of alfalfa. Well, it's also made out of grass. Yeah, grass and alfalfa. It's actually a mixture, according to the. Right. No, the, I understand, where, you, I I understand where they're going with it, but they thought this. If they, they this kind of thing is, is also something with that they could be growing this stuff in. Basically, I don't know if you call hydroponic gardens the right word, <laughs> but if they know this kind of thing's going to happen, we and and it's going to affect. The, we can manipulate the growth of this stuff indoors, and maybe that'll help out make the supply better. Just grow it on the moon. Well, I mean, if all of those were sustainable options. It would have already happened. The point, the problem is, is that you can do those things, but you can't do those things on a large scale yet, and certainly not to the quality and quantity that you can do outside. And obviously, it's already into the season, so these farmers are already at a at a you know position that's uncomfortable. You know, I mean, they don't have time to grow an entire new stock in a hydroponic farm, as Fred has suggested. Nor do they no, have I would say I, they should be doing that anyway, not as, right, not as, saying, they should, as an additional supply. Sure. I mean, it'd be great in the future if they could do that, but that doesn't help us this year. And I just thought that was really interesting because if it affects our dairy cows and if it affects the other cows, we're talking beef, we're talking milk, we're talking a lot of the things that people use every day. Even the vegetarians drink milk. Unless you're a vegan, you're affected by this. It's and the vegans same- eat alfalfa sprouts, right? So... <laughs> is the St. Louis area a farming community, you know, in the suburbs outside of St. Louis? I would say not so much in St. Louis. Now, other areas of Missouri are, but St. Louis, we don't have particularly good zoning laws, but we do not have farms inside the city. <laughs> no, I, I, 
I don't mean inside the city, you know, outside of the city. <laughs> no, I know, I'm just no. joking. <laughs> it's, it's, no, but no, no. where my office is located is surrounded by farm country. And uh, you know that. I mean, there's farm, well, and the farm, and farm in that area. And that's where, that, that's why I'm saying that I see these guys growing grasses, and I see them growing alfalfa, I see them growing barley, I see them growing wheat, I see, and I see them growing all of this stuff at the same time out there, and this stuff seems to be doing pretty well. Out there near uh, Allegheny? No, in, in western New Jersey. Part of Warren, most of Warren County, New Jersey, believe it or not, is still farmland. It preserved farm, New Jersey preserved farmland. There's oh, yeah. a lot of farms. Northwestern oh, New yeah. Jersey is all farms. Also, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so funny because, you know, I lived in New York for all those years, but when you live there for many years, you start to meet people from all over New Jersey, and you go a few times to the parts that aren't near the city, and you realize, oh, this is why it's called the Garden State. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's literally only Bergen, Hudson, and Essex County that are urban areas, and then whatever county is, you know, would encompass like Camden and Trenton. But so those are the only areas, I guess, well, the Camden, I know, is Camden County. I don't know if Trenton's also Camden Trent County Parson. or that's Trent another Parson. county. Okay. And then, well, even Bergen County isn't all urban, but certainly primarily Essex and Hudson counties are. But outside of, and Passaic to a lesser amount, Passaic kind of like Bergen, like a half and half. But outside of those counties, uh, New, Jer New Jersey is a lot of farmland and uh, nice areas, sure. Anyway, we have uh, the, the final story for tonight and is that BG singer Robin Gibbs in a coma brought on by, I think they said pneumonia. And he's battling against cancer, which has, seems to, pneumonia seems to come with people battling cancer because celebrities that have had in the past seem to battle with cancer, they get pneumonia, and they get wind up in a hospital. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the underlining story and issue is it's colon cancer. I guess that's the underlying issue yeah. here, really, you know. Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, can it's diagnosed with cancer of the colon and the liver, which... And the liver, you know, yeah. It's because of the chemotherapy that they go through that knocks out their immune system, they wind up getting pneumonia. Now, if, you, if people who don't know, who may live on the rocks, know uh, Robin Gibb is one of the four Gibb brothers, the Bee Gees, the Brothers Gibb, whatever you want to call them. Two brothers, Andy and Maurice, passed away over the last 15 years. Andy died very young, and Maurice wasn't really all that old, and he passed away either. So the family's had some, some health-related issues in the past. We're hoping to get, get some, some uh, updates on this. And the, they, they thought that they were saying his can they were hoping his cancer was in remission, but it may not be. So yeah, we're following that story. Well, while we're talking to that part of entertainment, do we have any lighter entertainment before we wrap things up, Gene and Holly? No, the only thing... Uh, any, like anybody dancing this week? <laughs> or, or not dancing anymore this They're week? Who cares? For Sherry Shepard. Sherry Shepard got uh, voted off this week, uh, unfortunately. And she was actually improving. She was getting better, but... Not good enough. Not good enough, so she was voted off. So Is we'll... this down to a final four yet or something? Or how much longer do we have to be subjected uh, to this? down to eight couples now. Ugh, this is still going to go on forever, huh? Yeah, only eight, Ed. Come on, hang in there. <laughs> Not that far, right? What, they start with nine? <laughs> no, 12. 12. Yeah. See, yeah. so it's going to be going on forever yet. Yeah, anyway. They say, what? They lose, they, what? They lose one person for a couple of weeks, so it's for another eight weeks. There you go. Well, you know yeah, what yeah. makes two me nights. so... It's two nights a week. Hey, so is American Idol. You guys watch amateur things two nights a week. You can handle some... I don't, watch American, I, I don't watch American Idol either. I will say this, that this year's Dance with the Stars is like the most intense of all the shows they've ever had. Oh, right? Uh, I mean, there have been seasons where they had like Jennifer Grey and ice skaters yeah. and people who are really good dancers anyway. But this season is just really close. Everybody's very similarly talented. Everybody kind of came out early. You've got like the William Levy. You've got the, you've got the opera already, singer please. who like knocked it out of the park. Listen. This is entertainment news, and this is happening. Buckle and this, this show's on what What night is this show on? Monday, Monday night. Monday night. Oh, well, first thing Tuesday morning when I get up, then I'm going to have to check about this. Isn't Monday oh, Tuesday? yeah. Well, I mean, in all fairness, you know, I talk, I talk about all sorts of stuff from the Pocono Records for you, Fred. So you can listen to a oh, little I dancing know. with it. the stars. In, uh, <laughs> in, the two, in the two nights a week? Yeah, they dance, Mondays and Tuesdays. they dance on Monday night, and then the result show is on Tuesday night. Why not just do two hours and waste one night? Right? That's what I... Well, it's more than two hours. It's a long show. Yeah. 
I will... two, two hours the first night and the hour the second night, so. And these, these are the same so... people that were complaining that some girl took dancing lessons and called her a cheat, right? It was Sherry, actually. I'm just saying, it's the same show. Where yeah, somebody you. who may not know, who's not comfortable with it, goes out and takes dancing lessons and they said she's cheating. Oh, and she's the one that just got thrown off? It's true. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. It's true. So, I mean, apparently she was at a disadvantage, obviously, and that's one of the reasons for her getting kicked off. She was, I mean, a lot of these people either had prior experience or just are very talented. I mean, there's an opera singer, uh, I can't remember what her name is, but the opera singer is just sweeping the floor with everybody. And she, I mean, her last name is Jenkins. That's I right. That's her, right. Her, uh, Catherine Jenkins, that's who it is. Yep, yeah, Catherine Jenkins. Yeah, she's good, though. I mean, yeah, in all fairness, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be so bad if the people that they use were actually stars and celebrities. That's my biggest objection to it. I mean, I don't have a problem. With well, but so what, what's wrong with it being an amateur hour? No, 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 no. I'm not talking. I'm not talking. It's called. It's called Dancing with the Stars. Oh, yeah, so let's that's have true. it be Dancing with the Stars. Call it Dancing with the Amateurs keep, then, if it's amateur keep, hour. No, but let's keep Bristol Palin off of it. Let's keep Kate Goslin off of it. Get some stars. Make it an amateur Dancing with the Stars. Get an I still think Jennifer Grey was a perfect fit for it because she was a, is a dancer. I'm just saying, but Jennifer Aniston. Grey. Jennifer Gray. Oh, Jennifer Gray. Yeah, she. But that yeah. was the problem is she was practically a professional. I mean, nobody else in her season. I wanted to root for her, but like nobody else in her season had the experience that she had. Her father is Joel Gray. She Joel Gray, exactly. Up yeah. On yeah. Which, which, which is I fine. Mean, come on. But my. Yeah, but, but I mean, my, the problem is. The problem is that they're that they're making celebrities and stars out of people who have done nothing in their lives to deserve that title. I don't think that's fair. I mean, what the, what did Crystal Pale do except be the be the daughter of the governor of Alaska? What okay, did Kate Gosling do front, except get actually. except except have eight children to get on a reality show? What has she done to earn celebrity status? Nothing. Now, if you take yeah. if you if you take a guy like Rosie Greer, let's say, and you get him on a dance floor moving, well, there's a man who who be, who, who, who spent a career in football. Or I like to see Mike Tyson up there dancing. Now that'd be interesting. Oh come on, I'm but sure they don't. have those two. Jerry Rice did the show. These you can't guys complain about that. Come on, What's Fred. That? Jerry Rice did the. Jerry Rice did the show. Oh no, um, I'm not talking about that. Kind Ward did the show. No, no, but you I'm, know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm talking on. about people that are not celebrities in their own right, be, being called stars, being, just to get ratings, and I don't like that. Well, you know, Jr. Okay, Jr. was 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 great. JR. Okay. Yeah, Jr. the guy that was in um, Iraq. Oh, Jr. Martinez. Martinez, I yes. I love him. That guy was great. Oh, he's on a soap opera. He's a war. Okay, he's a, he's but he's a, also uh, but he's yeah. also an actor. He is an accomplished. He's not somebody's son who's getting their fame off for their parents' fame, which happens all the time. It happens all the time, and I always say this. Well, that's but, true because Rob Kardashian was on. So I mean, come on. Yeah, but, but he did do better than his sister. That's for sure, Holly. But what makes these people... Yeah, right, he's living off the fame. Care. Well, they're all living off the fame of their father, who was O.J.'s lawyer. I mean, exactly. how stupid of a thing to get famous on is that, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Not that that's not stupid. I mean, it's going because to we allow it to happen. We allow what to happen? We allow these people to have their fame by live vicariously through other people. I mean... No, you're take, right, because I find Paris the Kardashians Hilton. really What has Paris Hilton done with her life except be the daughter of a Hilton? Nothing. She's done nothing. No. So why would we show a TV show about her? Because it gets ratings. So I, I want to know if we're going to have Lindsay Lohan come on the show. Oh, I, I, have well, no I just heard at one point that they were. I wonder why she's not, actually. I don't know. I, I had heard... I it, heard it, it may be because were. of her rep. It may be because of of, of what she, or, or it could be a commitment. There's, there are contractual commitments that people have, but it could be because of her reputation as well. Yeah, that's true. As a follow up, actually, from our talk last weekend, speaking of things that get famous based on other things, you know, Titanic came out in 3D this weekend as a follow up from our talk last week, and yeah, uh, actually came in third at the box office. So they re released a movie. And they came in third at the box office behind a reboot of the American Pie series. Well, not a reboot, actually, just another sequel of the Se American Pie another series. Another sequel. And The Hunger Games. You know, when did people stop making original movies? Can anybody answer that for me? Is, is there any such thing as an original movie? Is I mean, think about it, really. I think, they've already, I think they stopped around the 70s because up from that point, I mean, they're, they're making remakes of everything. 
kind of sad. I mean, I think Hollywood is actually running out of ideas. And I think that's why they're uh, doing all these remakes. Well, and I think they're getting lazy, too, to be honest with you, Fred, because of all the response from reality TV and documentaries. I don't think they really are trying as hard anymore. I feel like it's more, it's either it's something that's based on an already wildly successful There's book, original work it's... out there. We have some of it in our library at BaseNet. No, that's, I mean, that's true. And, I mean, to be honest with you, actually, last night, John and I watched Black Dolls. Blackballed, which was a movie about uh, paintballing made by, like, Rob Corddry and his buddies. And it was a great movie. And, you know, I think it, I'm pretty sure it went straight to the online format. It was not released in theaters. Yeah, but do, know. You want to see was, Black, but do you want to see Blackball 2, Blackball 3, and CD Sense around? No, and that's the point. Is I think with the Internet, I feel like people are releasing things online. People are releasing things other ways. They're doing it at lower budget. I mean, look at Joss Whedon and Dr. Horrible. That was incredibly innovative and unbelievable, although I'm a huge Joss Whedon fan, so obviously I'm biased. But, I mean, there are, you know, there are excellent movies out there. There are excellent stuff coming out new. We've got a lot of, a lot of innovative ideas. You know, people but think it's not they, coming they out on the out big, of it. But it's not coming out on the big screen anymore big screen. because... Because the film companies are not really willing to take a risk anymore. Well, They're not going to take a risk. you got to remember because, the cost involved. I mean, of course. Remember, but remember a, union, a, union film, a, a union film, the union gets 34% of everything you do. Right off the top of that, right off the top of your uh, of your uh, uh, your bottom line, thirty four percent comes right off and goes to the union. Which you know, I mean, and I'm not saying that it's not deservedly so. It costs millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to make a movie, and if you don't make that back in your first weekend, you're done. I agree, but I think the part of the problem is, and I think that I, you know, I had the great great honor of listening to both the CEO of Focus Features and uh, one of the CEOs of Lionsgate talk about this right before the merger with, with Summit. And, you know, they're looking for new material, but they're also trying to find a way to navigate the way people watch movies these days. Because, like I said, some of the stuff that's been released online and things like that, I'm paying for that, and I'm watching that online, and I'm doing it in a smaller format. And right now, it's not the revenue driver. So for what they're very choosy about what they release in the box office, because if it's not going to be a huge hit, it's not worth the chance. Whereas years ago when we went to the movies for almost everything and we didn't watch anything at home, they could take more chances because if they could get a small audience, they could recoup a smaller cost. But now those smaller films don't make it in the theater. People watch those at home and they pay less for them and they're still trying to figure out how to how to navigate those waters. Uh, they'll figure you it out. Know, Holly, I just uh, saw the other day, I don't remember the name of the movie, but they're actually showing the movie on my TV service before it hits the theaters. Yeah, a lot of a lot of it could have been anything because a lot of movies are doing that now. But no matter yeah. what you do, there's nothing like seeing it on a big screen. No, but that's true. On, but it depends on in the some movie cases. Though, yep, yeah. I agree with yeah, that. I'm in with some that. cases, yeah. Be because if there are fantastic special effects, unbelievable high quality cinematography. You know things like that. I would then there's more, stuff that we see. I don't need. I don't need to see American Reunion in a theater, but I need to see Titanic in a theater. No, exactly. absolutely. Right. American right. Reunion. Did you see a Titanic 3D yet, or have you had a chance to yet? Not yet. I'm going to. I want to. Yeah. And you know, ABC this weekend actually had a remake. Of oh, don't get me started. No. I. I tweeted and Facebooked and Google Plus about that last night. Go ahead. What are your opinions? It wasn't bad. The last part is tonight. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I recorded it so I can watch the whole thing from the beginning. But uh, what oh, I what's saw... That, what's that, Gene? Titanic. Yeah, Titanic. ABC made a new uh, a new version of it, and it's like in four parts. Oh, uh, Gene, parts let me tell you something. The iceberg did it. <laughs> you ruined it for me, Fred. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Fred, why There's... are you and my dad the same person? <laughs> 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 exactly my, dad. my my problem with this Titanic movie uh, miniseries, Gene, and it's what I posted on social media last night while I was watching it. Um, I there that. I was subjecting myself to three hours of this, thinking, hope, or not thinking, hoping once again against all lost causes that this might be a Titanic movie. And I'm watching it. And it's a love story. Yeah, I, so, I, yeah, I noticed that right off so, the bat. So right away, you know, I had a post about, well, here's here's another tie, or I posted something like, uh, why do all Titanic movies need to be love stories? 
I wrote that my laugh. They draw you in and they stick it to you. So what I did just this morning, as a matter of fact, I went back and I watched A Night to Remember. Now that is what sets the bar for Titanic movies. Of course. There will never be another A Night to Remember. And I, I, I now haven't watched it in a couple of years. Obviously, I don't. It's not a story you forget because it's the real story. It's the the meat of the story. Exactly. So you, you don't forget it. But I hadn't watched it in a few years. And I watched it this morning and I said, you know what? This, this, this is what I'm looking for. This sells me. This is the Titanic story. It's uh, a definitive version of Titanic. Yeah, it just it really is. told exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And that's what was disappointing about the three out of the four parts of the ABC miniseries I've seen so far. I will watch the final part tonight since I watched the first three. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's the really, it. you know, this, this ABC, the only thing that I do want to say about the ABC miniseries is it's almost a nice cross between A Night to Remember and, and Jim Cameron's is, yeah. Titanic. Mm -hmm. Because it did show a lot more of the historical aspects like A Night to Remember, but yeah. yet it had extremely, and Gene, is, I imagine you're the only one other than me that's seen this. Holly, Fred, Larry, you haven't seen it? No, I think I'd like I to remember. Okay. I, I so, no, no, I mean, I mean last night's. I mean last night's. So this, this ABC miniseries, what I mean by the comparisons, is it's got a lot of the historical facts of A Night to Remember, but yet some of the, we'll call them main characters. What, John Cameron's A Night to Remember? It's Night James to, Cameron, not John Cameron. A Night to Remember is done by John Cameron, basically. James Cameron did Titanic. James Night James to Cameron. Remember was 1958. No, I know. Things. What I'm saying, this, if you're going to take this, combine both movies together, you'd have what you have. You know, pretty good. Uh, kind of, sort of, yeah. But so, so the negative aspect of it, in my opinion, as I see it, is that where we get the Jim Cameron part of it is the major characters, you're looking at this love interest thing. There's, there was also this stupid, ridiculous love triangle thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that. my God. I, You know, if, if I almost <laughs> came close to shutting it off, it was when they really pursued this love triangle portion of it. Like, this, what baloney. So this morning I went and watched Night to Remember, so I'm happy now. Well, even James Cameron said that Night to, Night to Remember. Yep. Is a definitive version of the Titanic. Absolutely. It's, why didn't it's the he gold standard of it. Remember. Right. For a whole new generation. Yeah, he chose to get the get the love story into yeah, exactly. You know, well, he also I bet thought they did that right the first time. He felt like that had already been done right, so he wanted to do something. Yeah, right. and uh, absolutely. And Titanic '97, it it was for. And another thing Cameron said, it was for the 16-year-old girls. 16-year-old girls would not watch A Night to Remember. But 16-year-old right. girls back in 1997 and even up until today have seen Titanic 97 20 times. So, I was 17 or 18, and there you I go. did. There you go. So that's, go. that's, that's the point. point. <laughs> is it for me? I, I I love Titanic 97. I think that is a very me good too. movie. Yeah. But Titanic 97 is not a night to remember. A night to remember is the gold standard. It's what we Titanic judge everything Titanic 97 by. is what it is. It's a love story. A very right. good, well, a well-written, well-acted, well-done love story, but it's not the story of Titanic. Yeah, and my final, my final criticism on the ABC miniseries, while it is very, very similar to Titanic 97, it's not Jim Cameron, and it shows. Yeah, yeah. It's it's still not even Titanic '97. It's nothing exactly. like exactly. Yes. So Titanic '97 has become a gold standard of its own. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I think that's important to hear. It's you a love say story that, named Titanic our, because you're definitely our resident historian. <laughs> right. Exactly. If you're gonna make a love story and call it Titanic, make it by Jim Cameron. Yeah, and yeah. and I I. Again, we were talking last week, I guess, about the Cameron updated documentary that he's done. It's currently showing on National Geographic Channel, where he's compiled all of his research that he's done over the past 30 years since making the movie. And he personally has 33 dives down to Titanic, so he is really That's the Titanic expert. 
and he's finally now washed his hands of it and said he's turning the baton over to the next generation of explorers and all, and there's enough of people now that have picked up, you know, the reins and to where they're, because there's the whole conservancy movement going now and everything where they want to, uh, again, as we've discussed last week on our Titanic show, where they want to prevent people from going down and stripping whatever's left there now, whatever hasn't been stripped so far. He's finally now washing his hands of it because he said he's done as much with Titanic as he can. But in this final look back, uh, matter of fact, this documentary is called Titanic, my final word or something on the subject. He does an updated version of all of the graphics that were used in the 97 movie of the sinking, you know, all of the CG effects of when you saw the ship sinking, and updates it with all of the information that's become available since they filmed in 97 or 95, whenever they filmed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not that much different, but now they know exactly where the ship split in half. Well, now they know definitively that the ship did split in half up on the surface. They know exactly where it split in half. Then they now also could pinpoint exactly where and how everything settled onto the bottom of the sea floor. So he updated all of the graphics. And to make a very long story short, he said he's been asked many times now, why didn't he do it for the 3D version, or is he going to do it in the future, updating Titanic 97 with these new CG effects? And he said, no. He says, it's done. To use Fred's terminology, it is what it is. He actually even said, I, I got a chuckle out of that when Jim Cameron said, it is what it is. I thought of you, Fred. He said, it is what it is. He said, when we filmed Titanic back in the mid-90s. Where did he think he got that? <laughs> yep. When they filmed Titanic back in the mid-90s, it was historically accurate with what they knew at that point. So he says they're not going to go around and change it now just because they have more revised statistics. So that was pretty cool, and I, I have a lot of respect for that theory. Well, according to James Cameron, he was on Good Morning America this week. And if you want to see the interview, you can go to abc.com for that at Good Morning America. But he said that when he redid the movie for the 3D release, he did change some things in there so it's more accurate. Just the uh, the stars. They, yeah, they got yeah. the constellations wrong in, yeah, the, exactly. in 97, yeah. so they made that correction. And, yeah, the av so the average viewer, myself included, wouldn't even notice that because I mm -hmm. don't know or don't care about the constellations in the movie. But, right. yeah, so he did correct that. Right. Yeah, he did. Very interesting. So I guess that's our follow-up to last week's show, but it was appropriate because at 1140 last night, it hit the iceberg 100 years ago, and at about 2.20... This morning, about 13 hours, 15 hours ago, it sank. So, and that would fit right into our obits. <laughs> yeah, which I don't even know. Do we have any obits this week, Fred, or is that it? No obits. Well, I guess we could, 100 years belatedly, discuss the uh, 1,500 plus people that lost their lives on the RMS Titanic in 1912. And no, we're not going to name them. Uh, and Larry was all ready for that. I think Lobster had his <laughs> list of everybody that was lost. No, unfortunately, I don't have a list. But we could just name them. We'll lump them all together and say well, that the Titanic, people that lost their lives on the Titanic 100 years ago are today's obituary on today's okay. show. There it is. So I guess that does, just about does it. Holly, you have nothing else? Nothing else for me. All right, so that does it for this week's show. What was it, 38 of As We See It? 38, wow. And 38. on April 15th, 2012, Titanic I Day. I And I guess uh, from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. In the Pocono Mountains, Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. From St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. And from Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And thank you so much for listening today. Just a brief reminder, if you want to hear some of the best songs ever recorded from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, tune in to GMM Radio at GMMRadio.com. Thanks again for listening, folks. We'll see you next week on As We See It. Have a great day. <laughs>